Okay, so uh, let's start, try and start the talk by trying to, uh, yeah, okay, I think I get have to remove people on my little view um, so I can see my talk. Okay, so um, I've been going to an online seminar about um, uh, epidemiology uh, run by Dan Coombs and others, and this talk was um, inspired by a seminar that Niels Brunn gave in that series. He was working with Caroline Klein, who's an epidemiologist at um, SFU, and others on modeling contact tracing. So they did some um, numerical work and commented that maybe um, an analytic solution would be nice. They were working, as most people working in applied epidemic theory do work in continuous time. Uh, and then I realized that um, I could couldn't solve the continuous time problem, though I'm not saying it's insoluble, but that if I looked at a discrete time model, things became much simpler for me. And so that's what I'm going to talk about. So the starting point of this talk is um, a discrete time Galton-Watson branching process, simple um, Galton-Watson process with offspring distribution PK. And um, the mean of the, uh, um, family size um, is, uh, we will call it lambda in this talk, but if you read the, pop, the newspapers, you will see the term R0 being banded around, and that's just the mean offspring number. And so probably everyone here um, has known about these processes for quite a while, but uh, how do we get this thing to move? Um, just remind you of a few basic properties of a branching process. So there's the, gen the off useful is the generating function G of S. The extinction probability is the smallest non-negative solution of Q equals G of Q. Um, Q equals one is always a solution, um, but there may also be um, another solution. And if lambda is bigger than one, then there is a solution of this equation, which is smaller than one, so that the extinction probability is strictly smaller than one. And let's just remind ourselves of the long-term behavior of these processes. Um, if lambda, the mean family size, is strictly smaller than one, then the process becomes extinct with probability one, uh, as is also the case except in one degenerate case when lambda is equal to one. And if lambda is bigger than one, then the process survives with positive probability. <clears throat> and in that case, it grows indefinitely and very roughly it grows at a rate um, lambda to the n. You can make this more precise in a number of ways. And so the case of interest in this talk is when the original uh, branching process is um, uh, supercritical. And so we're going to be looking at the genealogical graph of the um, process. So we start off with a founding individual at time um, zero. That individual has two offspring uh, the next generation, it would also seem everyone has two offspring. This is produced not because the, it's a degenerate distribution, but simply the sort of the way you tend to draw um, uh, expanding trees on the, on the plane. And the third generation, we vary things a bit. And this individual has no offspring, this one, this one, and this two. So and so it goes on and we have the genealogical graph of the process. And for an individual like this, the individual one step further towards the root, this one is called the ancestor. So now I'm going to introduce the model that we're looking at, uh, which is a sort of percolation type model on the um, dynamically involving um, uh, contact process clusters. And uh, the contact tracing model is going to depend on three parameters. An integer B, which is the waiting time, the detection probability P, and a contact tracing probability alpha. So B generations after infection, each individual is detected as being infected with a probability P. So we're thinking, if we're thinking disease terms of a disease which the symptoms show with probability P and don't show with probability one minus P. If you're familiar with the medical or epidemiological literature, such an individual is called an index individual. I hadn't met that. Um, terminology and still I started you know, reading papers in this area. If an individual is detected, then an attempt is made to trace all the contacts um, 
i.e. ancestors or descendants of that individual X. And each link in the genealogical graph is traced successfully with probability P. So we can think of having a, a percolation process with probability P of bonds being open on the genealogical graph. Tasted, test, traced individuals are tested uh, and it's assumed the test is 100% accurate. And the whole procedure is applied quickly in recursively um, at a specific point on um, time n for the process, and then we move on to the next time step. So I'll be showing you some um, uh, pictures in a few moments to sh help explain the process. And the index individual and all individuals linked to the index individual by traceable paths are immediately removed from the epidemic. So let's now see how this works in practice. So we're going to have a waiting time of two, and the process starts with one individual at time zero. Um, the first generation, there are two offspring, and red bonds indicate traceable bonds. So in this case, the, these, both these bonds are traceable. That's t equals one. The second generation, t equals two, now we have two traceable bonds and two untraceable bonds at this point. And U is going to stand for untraceable as an abbreviation in a little bit. Now, the waiting time is two. So we now go back two generations from the current time and we're going to see if this individual, the founding individual is detected or not. The blue circle means that individual is not detected. And so nothing happens at this point. So now we go on to the third generation. We have more traceable and untraceable like that. And now it's time to test to see if these two individuals here are detected or not. So to avoid being too boring, let's make one of them detected and one of them not detected. So this individual with the red circle around it is detected as being infected. And at this point, um, the contact tracers come in and look at this process and they can trace all along, they can trace essentially the percolation cluster connected by red bonds connected to the um, so-called red individual there. And what then happens is all those individuals are immediately removed from the process. So we now just have three individuals left um, in the um, third generation. And then at the next step, those three individuals can continue to um, reproduce and they will have more um, offspring. And now we're in the fourth generation and the next step will be to see if either of these two individuals is um, uh, detected as infected. So if this individual were detected, it would remove stuff in the past of this guy, but it wouldn't remove this guy, so it wouldn't actually have any effect on the evolving process. If this individual is detected, this guy will be fine. These guys will be, of course, fine because it's a different cluster and this guy will be removed. So this is the... So, uh, so the contact tracing forward and backward has the same probability then? Yes. Um, for simplicity, yeah. Okay. So this is the process. So the main question is, given our offspring distribution PK, um, our waiting time B, and our detection probability P, how long does the, how large does the alpha, the contact tracing probability, have to be in order to make the associated epidemic die out? So I'm going to call this process CTB. B, P, alpha, when I want to talk about its distribution, if I want to talk about it as a stochastic process, I'm going to call it ZCT. In other words, the branching process Z post contact tracing. So just to make you familiar with the model and because it's kind of easy, let's just st start with some easy results that we can um, get. So the first one is um, we have some monotonicity. Um, if the contact tracing process with parameters B, P and alpha becomes extinct, and we have a shorter waiting time, a bigger detecting probability, and a bigger tracing probability, then the process with prime parameters becomes extinct. And that's easy. You can set up a coupling, and um, uh, there you are. So because of this monotonicity, it makes sense to define the extinction function, which is EBP, is the smallest alpha, such that the process becomes extinct. And a bit of notation, individuals are going to be detected or not detected, in other words, D or N. 
And bonds are going to be either traceable or untraceable, i.e. T or U, and an individual is T or U if the bond from its ancestor to itself is um, T or U. So we basically have four types of individuals, um, uh, you know, NT, NU, um, and so on. Okay, so second easy result, um, just dealing with some um, cases where you hardly have to do any work at all. So if, if P is naught, then the process survives with positive probability. I'm giving you these proofs just so that you can get a little more familiar with the process. And the proof here is no individual is ever removed because not, nobody's ever detected. And we originally assumed that lambda was bigger than one. Now, if the tracing probability is one and P is bigger than naught, then the process becomes extinct. So in this case, all bonds are traceable. So we have one big red cluster and one of two things happen. Either the process Z becomes extinct or the process Z grows indefinitely. And if the process Z grows indefinitely, ultimately an individual is going to be detected and then the whole process becomes extinct because the contact tracing will immediately destroy the whole cluster. If B is bigger than one and the tracing probability is zero, then the process survives with positive probability. And that's because the individuals in the current generation are never removed. And then we have um, a couple of results with um, equations. In this case, D, we compare the process with the process of undetected individuals who, if you're an undetected individual, that means that your, the link from your ancestor to you is, um, no, sorry, an undetected individual is not removed in, okay, sorry, if the undetected individuals are become extinct, then the whole process is, is smaller and so the whole process becomes extinct. And for the final case, let's look at the process of NU individuals. These are going to be important anyway for, for what's going to come. An NU is an individual is a kind of Markov splitting of our process. The individual is not detected and the bond from them to their ancestor is not, is untraceable. So the only way that an NU individual can ever be removed is by one of its offspring being detected. So the NU process is smaller than the um, contact tracing process. And so if the NU process survives, then the contact tracing process survives. So because we've dealt completely with the case when P equals naught, um, from now on, we're going to assume um, to avoid degeneracies that the uh, probability of detection is bigger than zero. And the key decomposition that we have is using these NU um, individuals. I should mention this is not um, uh, uniquely my idea. One of the reference papers that I will show you by Ball a number of years ago used exactly the same idea. So if the edge from X to Y is untraceable, black, we call the individual Y a cluster seed marked in green. So in the evolution that we see here, the three cluster seeds that we have here are marked in green. And each cluster seed is the root of a new traceable cluster, which is not affected by the rest of the system. So we have this kind of Markov splitting. And so let W be the number of cluster seeds of the root cluster. And here's our first theorem, which is that the process becomes extinct if and only if the mean value of W is less than or equal to one. So we simply now rearrange time and we look at a new branching process where the, we have a founding individual, the number of cluster seeds of the first, in the first traceable, of the first traceable cluster. The first traceable cluster in this case produces three cluster seeds at different times. Now, the number of cluster seeds produced by each of these clusters is going to be the second generation of the new branching process and so forth. So we, we get a new um, simple Gordon-Watson process. And because we're not in the degenerate case, the um, process becomes extinct if and only if the expected value of W is less than or equal to one. So all that remains for us to do is to calculate the expected value of W. So let's look at the evolution of a traceable cluster without detection. 
and let's write VNT to be the number of individuals in generation N. Um, so now we have a new branching process with ostribuing distribution PK um, superscript T, and the generating function is a um, function or transform of the old generating function because the number of traceable offspring conditioning on an individual living V offspring, um, the number of traceable offspring is, has a binomial distribution. And let's write VNU for the number of cluster seeds, that is untraced individuals produced by the individuals counted in the n minus one generation of the cluster. And let S be the generation of the, of the first detected individual, then basically the Num random variable w, the number of cluster seeds produced by the cluster, is the sum of the VNUs up to the point when n is um, uh, s plus b. So s is the generation of the first detected individual, but remember we have a waiting time b. So all we now have to do is to calculate this. <clears throat> so let's write yn for the um, fam um, total um, uh, um, process size of the VKT process, then just taking expectations for W. Um, initially, for the first B generations, no nothing is ever removed, so we get this um, sum without any random variables in, and then we have this process. Um, we, we have these random variables here. So we now have to calculate um, the expected value of VNT of 1 minus P to the um, YNT. And we can use generating functions. This is sort of simple, basic um, branching process stuff. We write HNST to be this quantity. Uh, we do a standard first generation branching process decomposition to give us HN in terms of GT and HN minus one. And um, if we differentiate this with respect to S and evaluate it at P equals one, we get the expected value of um, this random variable here which is the thing which term appears in this sum. So we get a collection of recursive equations as is quite common with branching processes. We set G naught equal H naught equals one minus P, GN to be one minus P, GT of G and minus one, and HN to be given by um, this quantity here. So, and then once we have HN, then the expected value of W is this quantity. And so we have um, uh, this, um, serious um, uh, expression for the expected value of W. So it would be nice if we could calculate the HNs even in one case. So um, sometimes for branching processes, you can calculate things in the case when the offspring distribution is um, geometric. Uh, but unfortunately, while you can calculate the um, distribution of the ge nth generation, the family size has an additional um, uh, S term in it um, from the previous um, expression here. And <clears throat> uh, you, I rapidly convinced myself that at least I couldn't calculate the um, uh, HNs explicitly in this case. And so I don't know any case where you can get an explicit calculation for the HNs. On the other hand, if you implement it numerically, you find that <clears throat> um, there are sort of one powers of one minus p floating around. And so the formula that you get here converges very quickly in practice um, unless p is close to zero. So um, I think I may be going a bit faster than I was anticipating, but never mind. So some further questions, which I'll be talking about um, in principle after the break, but we'll see how it goes, is, um, so if you're an applied person, um, you might not be interested in this model at all. And if you are, um, this is probably the formula um, that you're interested in. But if you're sort of more theoretical like me, you might want to know what happens close to the various critical points in this model. So there are three critical cases. The first is when the alpha is equal to EB of P, and so you have the interchange between extinction and survival. And the second case is, I'll show you a picture in a moment, is when B is zero and P is one minus lambda to the minus one. And the third case is when P equals naught and alpha equals one. Um, so P equals naught is uh, 
um, um, no detection, alpha equals one is all bonds traced. And well, I'll, I'll come back and discuss that in a, in, a, in a few moments. And another question we can ask is, if alpha is not big enough to um, lead to extinction of the process, then how quickly does it grow? <laughs> And I'll give details of the answers to these two questions after the break. So now let's look at some um, graphs, um, just to give you an idea of how things look. <clears throat> so this is with a Poisson survival distribution for means two, three, four, and five. <clears throat> so you see that in this case, when B is zero, um, alpha at some point even when alpha is zero, um, the process becomes extinct if P is big enough. Um, that's simply because when an individual is detected, they are immediately removed from the process. So we have a, a picture like that. <clears throat> and you'll see that at the point P equals naught, alpha equals one, um, these, these curves are all approaching that, er that value there. When P is naught and alpha is smaller than one, you get survival when alpha is one and p is bigger than naught, you get extinction. So this is the second and more interesting of the two critical points. And this one here is the rather less interesting one. Um, now let's look at see what happens if you vary the waiting time b. So this is the picture that we saw before, the black line. If the waiting time is bigger, <coughs> is one, then it, it goes down like this waiting time two and three, um, uh, it goes like that. So when um, the waiting time is large, the detection probability has very little effect on the overall, um, uh, um, on, on, on what alpha has to be in order to get the process to um, go to extinction. Um, I also thought, let's look at some different distributions. So these are all um, original distributions with mean three. And I calculated the um, curves in this case. As you can see, they're um, close, but not all the same. It seems that the um, higher the variance of the distribution, the lower this function um, EB of E0 of P is going to be, um, but I don't have any proof of that. And finally, here's a graph of the first five turns in the sum. Um, unfortunately, I can't remember exactly which case it was, probably Poisson um, 2.5. And you'll see that um, that's the first term, second term, third term, fourth term, and fifth term. So that, and except when you're getting very close to P equals zero, the series in this case converges very quickly. <clears throat> and just to repeat something which um, I already mentioned, for larger values of the waiting time, the detection probability plays very little role. So this is the function EB of P for a Poisson distribution with mean three. So if the waiting time is one, um, we get you know, these numbers here. And if the waiting time is two or three, then we have numbers very close to one. You need very high tracing um, probability in order to make the epidemic become extinct. And here are some references. Um, there's a huge, um, well, substantial applied medical literature, not surprisingly on contact tracing, not so many theoretical uh, papers. These are some of them. And as I said the, before, the paper by Ball, Nock and Neal is the one which is um, most sort of um, mathematical and um, closest to this work here. Well, I seem to have run through my um, time to the break um, uh, rather quicker than um, I thought but still I don't suppose there's any reason not to have a break now. So we can have a break and some questions and then I will talk about the critical points and a few more things um, after the break. Are your slides available? <laughs> Okay, so um, I promised you to give you one or two more results after the break. Um, <clears throat> so um, um, we're going to look at the critical cases and uh, the first two are um, perhaps not so in quite so interesting. Uh, if on the critical line where, where alpha is equal to EBP, the process become extinct. And that's simply because um, 
a branching process with exact, expected value of offspring distribution one becomes extinct and this object, um, the expected value of W is continuous in alpha. And if um, we're on the critical point, um, uh, the ones of that sort of place, then um, uh, you'll notice in the um, draw picture that we get a very vertical line down. This is actually a square root um, uh, um, in this case. And we prove that simply by expanding the generating functions near this critical point. The second critical point is the more interesting one, which corresponds to a large traceable cluster with a small detection probability. So I tried handling that by analytic methods and found it, I get myself um, struggling somewhat. Um, this is also the case that it's not very susceptible to numerical study because when P is small, the series of uh, HN is converging slowly. Um, and the process, as I said, survives on one axis and becomes extinct on another axis. Um, but in fact, what we find is that um, the line is almost certainly um, linear with, with some slope, but all I was able to do was to get upper and lower bounds for um, uh, the critical um, value alpha. And in the case B, um, I needed also to put in the condition of the second moment on the offspring distribution. And um, here's the sketch proof. Um, I finally realized there was a Martingale argument that one can use here. So we're going to look at the traceable cluster with root or seed zero and do an exploration of it individual by individual. And for each individual, in turn, we look at whether it's detected or not detected. And we're going to look at the number of U offspring of that individual X. So um, let UN, after we've looked at N individuals, let UN be the number of, of U offspring counted and DN be the number of detected individuals um, that we've met. Then we can do some simple um, Calculations give us that the expected value of dn plus one given information up to time n is dn plus p. This thing is un plus lambda to one minus alpha. So we've got a martingale. We stop the martingale at the first time that we meet a detected individual, um, fiddle around a bit, and we get um, a proof of one of the bounds. Um, the other bound is a little bit more work, but that's the basic idea. Now, um, okay, yeah. <clears throat> and the final topic I want to talk about is a growth of the process in the survival regime. So let's go back and recall a traceable cluster starts with a cluster seed at generation zero. And we originally looked Previously, we looked at the traceable cluster without detection, so that thing may grow indefinitely. But let's put a tilde on this now and write the tilde in U to be the number of U individuals in generation U when ultimately this traceable cluster is going to be made extinct by some individual in the cluster being detected. So similar to the calculations we had before, the expected value of W is the sum of the mean number of traceable individuals in each generation from one to infinity. And I'm going to write that as the sum from one to n of Zn, where Zn, of course, is this thing here. So something which people in this area call the Malthusian parameter, theta, is um, defined, which is the um, unique number theta such that this sum here is equal to one. And let's just remind ourselves that because we're in the case when the process originally, <laughs> we're looking at the case when the expected value of W is bigger than one, this sum is bigger than one, so theta is going to be bigger than zero. And then on the event that the process does not become extinct, of course, even in the supercritical case, um, there's a pos positive probability of extinction, but on the event that we don't have extinction, then Zn CT is growing as um, uh, um, e to the n theta. And let's now see how we prove that. And in fact, what we need to do is, or what I found I needed to do, is to look at a branching process with um, infinitely many types. So if you've got a cluster C, I get the next slide will be a picture. 
which will hopefully make things a bit clearer. For a cluster seed in generation M, let V tilde NU of X be the number of cluster seeds in generation M plus N um, arising from the traceable cluster with root X. And let CM be the number of cluster seeds in generation N. And we're going to define a multi-type branching process Rn with type set on non-negative integers by starting off with um, one individual of type zero at time naught and writing Rnk to be this sum here. I don't expect you to get much of a feeling for what this process is from that um, uh, definition, but I hope the next picture will look at here. So let's look at the picture um, uh, the, from the next slide and hope that this helps you understand or it helps me explain what's, what's going on. So here is the founding individual and here is the current generation N. And so Rn, we're going to start counting at N and we're going to be, so these little green things here are cluster seeds. So we look at all cluster seeds arising from clusters which Arrive, which, um, whose cluster seed is in generation N or before. So these two cluster seeds here count as points one here and here. This guy here produces cluster seed there and there and something in the root cluster, which is here. So this is what Rn. Now let's move forward this uh, multi-type branching process um, uh, one generation. So the first thing is we're doing a sort of shift this, gener this guy was originally um, six generations ahead, uh, five generations ahead of our marked point N. Next, after we've moved to N plus one, it's now going to be four generations. So all the cluster seeds that we've got are just going to make a leftward shift. But we're now we're going to look at the two guys that we have in generation N plus one here. This guy has a cluster, but no cluster seeds. This guy here has two cluster seeds. So we add these on. And so Rm is going to be this sequence here, and then we shift it back so that Rn is this, Rn plus one is this. So there are two things happening in our multi-type branching process. There's a general drift to the left, and then individuals in um, generation zero give rise to offspring, which are, may arise um, at any point in the um, subsequent process. So I then had to learn the theory of multi-type branching processes with um, infinitely many types, uh, which basically seems to have almost no results since about 1975, as far as I could, as far as I could tell. Um, so let MJK be the mean number of offspring of type K produced by an individual of type J. Then M0K is ZK. MJK is just a delta function which gives us the um, leftward drift of the individuals. And we'll define a vector uj to be e to the theta j. And it's easy to check that u is a right eigenvector. So it follows that if we look at this multi-type branching process and look at this expression here, we get a martingale. And since this limit, um, we, we get a martingale with mean one, non-negative martingale with mean one. So its limit is almost surely finite. And so we get one bound at the limb sup of this over e to theta n is finite. So that's the upper bound for the um, uh, um, for the limiting growth. And the lower bound proceeds in a similar spirit, but, but is um, a little bit more messy. And then I should also promise you that I would look at the critical point um, zero one. So I mentioned, wait a minute, have I, okay, I've given you this proof before. I moved stuff around and I forgot to delete this slide. So I think actually that's the end, the end of my talk. Any questions? Shall I stop sharing screen so we can see people? Sounds good. Um, okay, so let's uh, maybe first thank Martin.